Good afternoon, everyone. How's it going at AUSA so far? You guys having a good time? Can, can, how many steps did you guys put in yesterday? Anybody got a tracker? I went over 22,000 yesterday. I don't know what I'm going to get today, but and we're so glad that you're here with us. I'm CW5 retired Phyllis Wilson, an AUSA senior fellow, and I've been asked to open the ceremony, the, the forum this afternoon. So you're joining us for the contemporary military forum titled Transforming Warfighting Readiness. This is kind of like when you get on the airplane and you sit down and they say, welcome, your flight is going to, and they say a city that is not the one you thought you were going to. So if Transforming Warfighting Readiness is not the forum you thought you were going to, welcome. As your professional association, the Association of the United States Army is proud to provide forums like this one throughout the year that broadens the knowledge base on Army professionals and those who support our Army. AUSI, AUSA amplifies the U.S. Army's narrative to audiences inside the Army and helps to further the association's mission to be the voice for the Army and support for the soldier. Of course, we cannot do this alone. AUSA relies on its members to help tell the Army story and to support our soldiers and their families. A strong membership base is vitally important for our advocacy efforts in Congress, in the Pentagon, and the defense industrial base, and to the public in communities across the country, as well as nine other countries around the world. Who here is a member of AUSA? Please raise your hands. That's a good number. And for those of you that raised your hands, thank you. For everyone else, unless you opted out when you registered for this conference, <laughs> welcome. You are a new member of AUSA. It's a no-cost membership, and we thank you for that. If you are not yet a premium member and you would like to elevate your membership benefits, please stop by one of our membership zones. One is just outside of here. Uh, and check to find out what that entails. We can't do it without you and your help for AUSA to make sure we are an effective voice for the total Army and to provide support for the soldier and their families is key. So on behalf of General Brown, AUSA's president, and the rest of the AUSA team, the speakers have been given a small token of appreciation for their time I get to display it. It is a umbrella with the AUSA logo on it. We appreciate you being here with us today. Now I will turn it over to Rahul Gogate, the Director of Global Marketing Communications for General Dynamics Land Systems, who will provide some introductory remarks before turning it over to our moderator, Professor Carolyn Davidson. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. As mentioned, my name is Rahul Gogate. Uh, welcome to the Transforming Warfighting Readiness Panel. Uh, General Dynamics is a proud, long-serving member and sponsor of AUSA. This organization just does such a fantastic job year in and year out of bringing together industry executives, government officials, decision and policy makers, academia, and research institutions to discuss and witness firsthand the future of defense and military technologies. One key element of that forward-leaning posture speaks directly towards this year's AUSA theme, which is transforming for a complex world. A critical piece of that strategy calls for the transformation of warfighting readiness to modernize and restructure the Army to ensure a combat-ready and lethal force now and into the future. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Carolyn Davidson, Associate Dean, College of International Security Affairs at the National Defense University. Thank you, Rahul. And thank you, Phyllis, as well. Good afternoon, everybody. I did hope that we would get those umbrellas and do a kind of tap dance introduction just to make sure everyone was awake, but you're stuck just with some words at the start. But I do promise a very exciting panel this afternoon that is going to reinvigorate some of the things that you have heard touched on, I understand, yesterday and this morning. And we are very much looking forward to this being an interactive experience are you ready? Yes, audience participation, not tap dancing, but you do have index cards on your seats. Index cards that are for you to start jotting down questions that you will then 
foot in the air and wave to our runners. Can I ask them to, yeah. So our runners, so you do not have to put your name and affiliation on these cards. They can be anonymous, totally up to you. I have found this works very well for moderation to encourage those who are a little more shy to put questions down on these cards, give them to our runners, and then we will use them to inform some of the Q&A after we have started the conversation off from this stage. It's a real honor to be here again this year. Thank you to General Pappas for inviting me again to moderate this panel, and thank you to AUSA for choosing a really, I think, important theme that you heard reiterated just now. Transforming for a complex world. Yep. It's a complex world out there, and it feels like it's getting even more so daily. This panel is going to help us pick at that complexity by focusing specifically on warfighter readiness. Um, if we're being honest about it, transformation is a bit of a fraught term, right? It sounds good in theory, but in practice it can be quite hard to pin down exactly what we're talking about. So putting my academic hat on, I've pushed our esteemed panelists to dissect what transforming warfighter readiness really means, what we're doing now, what remains to be done. You're going to hear them address several core themes. What are we transforming from? How are we identifying the right gaps in readiness and bridging them? What are we transforming into and readying for? How are we ensuring our warfighters are ready for an uncertain future that appears to be infinitely complex, unpredictable, and so rapidly evolving that it seems impossible to keep up? What are we learning from current conflicts? How are we ensuring today's army is not just learning, but learning the right things the right way? How are we ensuring we apply lessons from one theater appropriately to ensure our warfighters are ready for a potentially different fight in another theater? Finally, lest you think this is just gonna take a few minutes this lovely Wednesday afternoon, what role does technology play? What, in practice, does transforming in contact really look like? And if we accept the Secretary of the Army's call yesterday to start thinking, and thinking urgently, like underdogs, taking more risks, embracing frugal innovation, facing challenges to our superiority consistently, what does that mean for training, readiness, and balancing technology as well as human input? Transforming? Warfighter readiness. Three speakers lined up here ready to take on these hefty problems. We have Dr. Frederick Kagan in the middle here. Dr. Kagan is the director of AEI's Critical Threats Project, a former professor of military history at West Point and acknowledged as one of the intellectual architects of the surge in Iraq. His books range from Lessons for a Long War, co-authored with Thomas Donnelly, to the end of the old order, Napoleon in Europe, 1801 to 1805. He earned his PhD in Russian and Soviet military history, but notably for us, he is just returning to his desk from a stint in Ukraine, and actually he tells me his third trip there in 18 months, where he met with Ukrainian Ministry of Defense and other senior leaders in an effort to understand particularly how the role of technology is impacting the battlefield. Next to me here, we have General Andrew Pappas, who is the commander of United States Army Forces Command, Fort Liberty, North Carolina, the US Army's largest organization. Prior to assuming command of Forcecom, General Pappas served more than three years as a senior leader on the Joint Staff, first as Director for Operations and later as Director of the Joint Staff. In his role, he assisted the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff as advisor to the President and Secretary of Defense. And then we have at the end here, Major General Brett Sylvia, who is the commanding general of the 101st Airborne Division and Fort Campbell. General Sylvia has served 30 years in the United States Army and has over five cumulative years deployed to combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. He commanded 2nd Brigade, 101st Airborne Division, TF Strike during the 26, 2016 to 2017 campaign to defeat ISIS in Mosul and he is currently pioneering the division's development of a unique large-scale long-range air assault capability. 
He is one, has one of the Army's Transformation and Contact Brigades under his command. So we're going to start the conversation here. Don't forget about those index cards. I will remind you that you should be jotting down questions. Um, and I want to start, actually, with Ukraine and the operational environment. Dr. Kagan, tell us what has struck you most returning here from your week there. Thank you so much. Um, it's, a, it's a real uh, privilege to be here at the AUSA uh, conference uh, speaking. It's a fantastic organization. Um, and it's an incredible honor uh, to, uh, to be on a panel with uh, General Pappas and, and General Sylvia, um, whom um, I've had the pleasure of knowing for um, more than 15 years now um, and interacting with them uh, occasionally in various theaters. So <clears throat> uh, I was in Ukraine um, in September along with the president of the Institute for the Study of War and my wife, Kim Kagan. Um, and ISW senior fellow and Natalia Bugayova um, for our third trip um, in 18 months, as I said. Uh, we spent about a week there and we, we got into a lot of uh, the nitty gritty with the guys uh, and gals there who are doing the, uh, working the drone uh, piece of that war um, and the electronic warfare uh, piece of that war and that interactivity. And that's, I think, where we should begin as we talk about what, we, what lessons we can and should learn from the war in Ukraine that are generally applicable uh, to warfare. Because there's a, there is a transformation in the character of war that is occurring now. And that I've, I've been one who has, over the course of my career, been reluctant uh, to say things like that. When people were getting very excited about revolutions in military affairs, I, I was the one who tended to try to argue contrarily uh, against that. But there really is one going on now. And it's characterized by the uh, use of unmanned systems <clears throat> at an unprecedented scale. And I think we do need to begin with the scale. The Russians recently announced that they will have produced and used 1.4 million drones this year. Uh, the Ukrainians uh, have the capacity to build 4 million drones. They only have the money to build 2 million drones. But collectively, the adversaries in this war will have put three and a half million drones on the battlefield this year. And they're scaling their abilities uh, to do that. It's a staggering number of unmanned systems. And it has created a number of important effects on the battlefield, <clears throat> one of which is what we at, the, at ISW refer to as the partially transparent battlefield. It's not fully transparent for a variety of reasons, but it is closer to a transparent battlefield than we've ever seen before. Because when you have millions of drones, or in a given battle sector, tens of thousands of drones operating, you can see individual soldiers. You can see individual small units. You can see every vehicle on the battlefield fundamentally. And with the number of first-person view drones and other such systems, you can kill individual tanks you can kill small uh, elements of squads in a cost-effective manner because these are drones that will cost three, $5,000. And they can be expended like munitions and not in the way that we've come to think about unmanned systems uh, here. So the scale of the, of the unmanned systems operations in Ukraine is one thing that's critical. But the other thing that has developed to an unprecedented level is the electronic warfare uh, that both sides are using against one another. One of the reasons, this is now known, one of the reasons why the Ukrainian counteroffensive last year was not uh, successful was because the Russians did something that's, as far as I know, unprecedented in modern warfare. They so blanketed the area with electronic warfare, the Ukrainian uh, tanks were not able to communicate with one another. They couldn't use their radios. They couldn't speak to one another. And so they bunched up and a variety of other things uh, happened. The, the electronic warfare race against the drones is now cycling at an incredibly rapid pace. And major changes will, will flow along the, the entire 1,000 kilometer battle line every two to three weeks. That's how rapidly uh, the innovation cycle is going on as these forces are in contact with one another. So 
we need to be thinking about an incredible scale of the deployment of these systems and also an incredibly rapid innovation cycle with the development of measures and countermeasures and counter countermeasures going on almost continuously along the entire front line. That is creating, a, I think, a real change in the, in the character of war. General Pappas, I hear speed, I hear scale, I hear continuous transformation. From your perspective, how is that shifting training priorities, scenarios, processes at Forcecom? Well, I think as, you, as you've heard Dr. Kagan, he captures very well the changing character of war and what we're facing today. And like any professional military, you're gonna to have to adapt to the environment as it changes. And that's exactly what we're doing. And part of it is you have to change also your training methodology and strategy, which you put out. And it starts with that view of first, we have to change for the future fight, but we can never forget, we still have a fight tonight requirement. So you have to maintain the readiness that you have today as you continue to prepare for the future. And that's exactly what we're doing. And we're doing it at multi echelons. And everything that Dr. Kagan laid out, these lessons learned that we've gleaned, you can see that incorporating first to our major training sites. When you look at the National Training Center, or down at the Joint Readiness Training Centers, you know, we are incorporating domains that we previously had not fought in. Space, cyber, the depth of soft integration. And then, and then with that, also the introduction of new capabilities that we're seeing on the battlefield today. You know, we talked about you know, the, the ubiquitous nature of the drone swarms. And when you have the drones that are also offensive and defensive, especially in the offensive realm, you have to develop new means of protection for your formation since there's new means of mass that they've identified. And within the electronic warfare spectrum, the electromagnetic nature of things, your ability to be identified because of what you emit. How do you mask your signature in this environment which you can easily be captured? And we're developing ways to do that. Also, how do you use that offensively to identify where the, where the enemy is? And we're utilizing all of these which we've gleaned from the current battlefield, not just in the Ukraine, but in the Middle East, and with the technology and capabilities we see in the Indo-Pacific, and we get the best of breed, and we incorporate those into the training centers, so that when the formation goes through, first they've trained a level to get there, I'll touch upon that, but they're facing the real life threat that they'll, that they'll face in combat against an opposing force that's empowered to utilize these and trained on utilizing them. So you've got a sparring partner that's gonna, that's gonna test you and make you better and identify those gaps. And if I could on that training methodology, there's a couple of areas you're looking at the adjustments. The first is our structure. How do we fight in the future fight? Then the equipping. There's new equipment that we're bringing back in, and it's over different time horizons. If you th sat through futures yesterday, they walked through those. And Brett right now is living the transformation in contact with the 12 to 18 months, and they'll expand upon that. So as you look at the structure, you look at the equipping, but then it's also the doctrine, how we're fighting. And our doctrine is changing today. Our new doctrine 3.0, I won't ask who's read it, because you'll all lie, <laughs> but in 3.0, it's elevating up to the division level again after 20 years of continuous conflict at the brigade level. It's now the division, because the division is the, the level in which you can synchronize those multi-domain effects in order to bring mass. And the division now, we're having rotations in the dirt. Previously, we hadn't done that, the brigade. The brigade is where you have your combined arms maneuver, and we're not walking away from that. But it's the, the division that's operating at that echelon, that's synchronizing across all the multi-domains that we're now taking out of a warfighter and putting them out in the dirt so they have that friction of combat, because that's the echelon we're going to fight at. And while I talk about the changing our approach to the fight, as we look at the, the brigades that are rotating, the divisions that are rotating, our warfighter exercise, which isn't in the dirt, but it's the simulation that stresses both divisions and core, we've aligned the core warfighters with our warfighting theater armies. And that's important, because that's the next echelon that we're gonna to have to be able to incorporate the capabilities. And you have to develop an understanding of what is available in that realm of capabilities, space, cyber, that we haven't dealt with before. And how do I, as a subordinate echelon, put the demand signal for the effects I need achieved on my higher headquarters and articulate those, know what's capable, and for that higher headquarters to be able to then meet those requirements and tell that back to me. And it builds that maturity of conversations when you do that through the warfighter. The same way the relationships are built 
on any type of playing field, and that through the execution of combat then, it refines our processes. General Sylvia, that sounds like a perfect segue to unpack a little bit more about transforming in contacts. We heard references there to friction in the dirt. From your perspective, can you unpack that a little bit for us? Um, yeah, so I guess uh, maybe taking it down you know, another level, um, you know, a couple of things that, that General Pappas talked about is that you know, at the end of the day, uh, we've got to continue to build our readiness. Um, so we do have a fight tonight uh, requirement. Uh, and so we have to maintain a training methodology that, that continues that, that building of combat readiness every single day. Uh, but now, uh, with the threat that, uh, that Dr. Kagan laid out, uh, we've got to figure out, so how are we doing the, the transforming uh, in contact now in order to be able to meet that, that current threat? And, and what I find is that you know, transformation in contact, having been through a bunch of modernization efforts over the last you know, 30 years, and, and yesterday General Rainey talked about it's not modernization, it's transforming, uh, and, and that's true um, because uh, there, there are kind of four big ways that what we're doing now is, is fundamentally different. Uh, one of them General Pappas talk, uh, talked about is that for you know, the last couple of decades, uh, we focused our transformation efforts on the brigade combat team for all the right reasons. We were deploying brigade combat teams that had to be self-sufficient out there. Uh, but now, based off of the fight that we're fighting, uh, we have to now do uh, uh, fighting as, a, as the division is the primary formation. Uh, like General Pappas talked about, you know, really kind of the lowest level where we truly integrate multi-domain effects is that division level. Uh, and so we've got to put the whole division out there in the field. We've got to test all of those systems and we can't have one portion of the formation that's modernized that brigade combat team without bringing along all of those functional brigades and all of those enabling formations uh, that are so critical uh, in order to be, uh, to be able to enable that fight. The second way that it's different is that uh, it's, it's user driven as opposed to lab based. Uh, in the past, we would generate a requirement down at the, at the operational level. Uh, it would go back to you know, somebody uh, at the enterprise. They would, uh, they would develop the system in a lab. Uh, and then uh, a new piece of equipment would show up sometime later. Uh, and uh, may or may not still be completely relevant, uh, but, but, but now it was lab-based. It would be completely tested, completely proven, um, but now what we are doing is we are taking capabilities as they are emerging, uh, and we are taking those capabilities, putting them in the hands of users, so then, then they can refine what actually those, those requirements uh, look like. The third way that it's different is that uh, it's continuous and, and iterative as opposed to previous efforts that were you know, really kind of episodic and, and somewhat scheduled. Uh, and, and this idea that it has to be continuous and iterative responds to what Dr. Kagan is talking about is that the pace of innovation is so rapid that if we don't keep it on a continuous cycle, uh, we're just not gonna be able to, uh, to keep up. Um, but then the last piece is that it's, it's operationally focused. Uh, as opposed to just doing new equipment training and new equipment fielding. Uh, we can't just field a piece of equipment or we can't just change an organizational structure without the operational concept that then goes with it. So we're out there in the field testing out, prototyping new structures. Uh, we're, we're working with new pieces of equipment, uh, but we're doing that in an operational construct, out in the field for weeks at a time in order to be able to, to work through these things. And, and a lot of times what I talk about kind of the the special sauce of transformation and contact is that when we go to the field, it's not just a new piece of equipment or a new structure uh, and you're just left to kind of figure it out. We now go to the field with those coders, those developers, those programmers that are right there alongside of us. And they're either there uh, to compel that, that piece of equipment to, to fit into our operational construct, or if it doesn't, to kill it. Uh, and for us to move on to, to something, something new. And that's how, how this effort is, is, is truly different than anything I've done in the past. This is, really a, this is really a best practice that I think stands out from the experience in Ukraine. Um, one of the things that is really enabling the Ukrainians to, uh, to transform and adapt so rapidly is the very, very close integration of the developers, the hardware and software developers with the warfighters and the incredibly rapid um, innovation cycle that that allows. So this is not something that should just be in training. This is something that the operational force needs to be able to do. The operators will see a problem and they will identify it for the developers, either hardware or software. They will come up with a prototype. The prototype will go to the field within days sometimes, within weeks. 
it'll be used, there will be immediate feedback. People will either go forward or it'll be sent back. And then the cycle will develop until they decide it's reached a point where it makes sense to begin to scale. And then they'll scale on that system. But even as that is happening, other, other changes are being made. Or alternatively, in the, the developers will be out in the field. And they will say, well, you haven't asked for this, but we could do this. And we could give you, we could give you this capability. We want to try that. And say, yeah, absolutely. That cycle, both sides are doing that in this war. And our adversaries are going to do this too. And this is something we really, really need to stay focused on. The, the PRC is going to do this. The Iranians are going to do this. The North Koreans are going to do this. And the Russians are already doing it. But the Ukrainians are able to do it better because they are more comfortable operating in a more decentralized fashion. And this is a place where the United States Army can also have an advantage because we have so much comfort uh, pushing down to low levels this kind of innovation and this kind of initiative. And that, that can really be a comparative, advantage for, a comparative advantage for us as well. I'll tell you, friend, one of the key pieces we have is when we look at this is the enterprise, and I do consider Forces Command part of the enterprise and the deuces right here in Mario Diaz, headquarters DA. We own the implementation of transformation. It has to be fully integrated, and it's a continuing conversation that I have personally with Brett and then the core commander as they execute this. It can't be an island or a one-time handoff of the equipment. That feedback mechanism that we spoke of, it's got to continue to flow both up and down, and then we have to be an enabling headquarters through the core in order to identify these lessons learned, because we're doing this in real time, both on structure and the equipping, and as we're adjusting it at the point of friction, we have to capture that so that we can turn it back both through the Army and then industry writ large so that it's a continuous process. So the conversation loop and feedback mechanism is ever ongoing and open. And we have not done that before. Gentlemen, can I ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the role of autonomous systems more specifically and robotics? What are we seeing as the major advancements there? Yeah. Well, why don't you touch upon it sure. in the Ukraine then? So, we've had, I think it's important, we always need to be careful about what are we talking about by autonomous system mm -hmm. because we've had autonomous lethal systems for a long time in a certain sense. But w what I think we're really talking about here is the use of AI uh, to get to a different level of autonomy. And we are seeing that in Ukraine. Um, it's coming along in some respects both faster and slower than uh, than one might have expected. It's, it's faster than I would have expected um, in the sense that the models are more suitable and can be trained and therefore we are beginning to see it. But it's slower because the implementers are coming up against some very fundamental challenges. Um, so just to take a minute or two on this, first of all, um, the Russians and the Ukrainians have a huge advantage in this regard because they have both developed manually tagged training sets of the kinds of systems that they are attacking that are huge and incredibly well uh, QA, QC training sets. So they have training and training sets are, the, are the, the gold that is required to make good AI models. They have those because they have been manually tagging them. Again, here I think the Ukrainians have advantages uh, in this regard for various reasons. So they have the basic uh, training set, more than basic. but. The Ukrainians that we talked to have distinguished between two forms of autonomy, last mile autonomy and full autonomy. Last mile autonomy is you manually fly the system to a place where it can hunt and then you set it free and say go, go kill something that looks like a, good, like a good enemy target. Full autonomy would be the system fire, launches itself from its launching point and then goes hunting. What's the challenge? The challenge is that you need to make sure that your fully autonomous system doesn't kill your guys. And this, this is a real problem, especially there where both, they're both using the same kit fundamentally. So it's not like you can tell it to go kill every T-72 that you see because that's not going to work well for the Ukrainians. Um, this, this is a big problem. Getting to full autonomy is turning out to be a real challenge. I think this is something that we will probably see it maybe 12, 18 months. We get different estimates and it's one of the few innovations over there where the time horizon keeps being pushed back rather than being pushed forward. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that there is a close fight there. There's a thousand kilometers of front line there, and it's a thousand kilometers of close fight 
with soldiers who are intermingled with one another and systems that are inter intermingled with one another. And this is a, the last point that I would make here, which is he, he, fully autonomous systems are going to come. We have to move away from le, you know, the discussion about lethal autonomous systems as, as an intellectual, as, a, as an ethical discussion and understand that it's going to be a practical discussion. But it's not going to replace humans on the battlefield either. Yeah. And so you're going to have to develop the ability to have autonomous systems in the context of the close fight. And that is an enormous technical challenge. And I agree with Dr. Kagan. And, and we've, as we've looked at this, as we've drawn lessons anywhere, and he hit upon it at the end, there's no autonomous battlefield. It's an integration of human and machine integration. And, and as you look, and we are a global army, so we have to be able to deploy and fight anywhere in the world. As such, that human machine integration, what that percentage looks like, and what capabilities you bring to bear will be dependent on the environment in which you're operating. And it can change within the environment itself and how you apply that. And that's, that's an imperative that we have to ensure that we understand. And uh, actually, I won't touch upon it. I'll hand it over to Brett, because part of it during your last rotation at JRTC with the autonomous capability, and you talked about fires and bringing the capabilities, what they do in, to have the ability to do is enhance the efficiency in which we operate especially with the data integration and the targeting. And Brett, if you touch upon that, I think it'd be helpful. Yeah, so uh, with respect to the, the first portion of that, the, the robotics piece, um, you know, that, that is something that is, you know, we have to train. Um, you know, we've got to be able to, as these new forms of mass are, are being integrated into our formation, it drives us to, to structure ourselves in new ways. It drives us to, to come up with new processes in order to be able to integrate them. So just from the, the first portion of this, just being able to, to even you know, take hundreds of, of UASs now and put them into our, our formation, um, we are attempting now to, to make first contact with unmanned systems so that we're, we're at that that, that, that leading edge uh, trading steel for blood instead of what we did formerly with our manned reconnaissance squad squadrons where we were trading blood for blood at that front line. And so we've got to be able to integrate these systems and then figure out what is the new structure that is going to allow us to be able to do that. Uh, things like we're developing uh, in our, uh, our brigades right now, the multifunctional reconnaissance companies, our multipurpose companies, so that we can figure out what is the structure that can control this and what's the, what's the human, what's the cognitive load that's now placed on, on these particular formations uh, as we're doing that. that. That piece that General Pop has talked about on the human machine integration, because it, it does, it drives us to be able to, to look a little little bit differently. And then the integration of AI. Um, you know, this is, uh, if, if we think about the things that are, that are most promising, most exciting, and, and in some ways probably the, the scariest part of this, is this integration of, of artificial intelligence. And, and there, are, there are great capabilities that, that are available to us. And, and just during this, uh, during this last year TC rotation, uh, James Stoltz and, and, the, and the 2nd Brigade, when they were uh, out there, uh, they, they put some of these systems uh, integrated. And so there's not, you know, kind of the silver bullet, uh, you know, just put some AI out there and, you know, and the, and the battlefield will be resolved. Um, it, it, is, it is our ability to, to take these and, and integrate them. Um, I've, I've heard you know, different Army senior leaders uh, talk about how at the opening moves of World War II, you know, everybody had radios, everybody had tanks, and everybody had planes. But it was the Germans in those opening moves that figured out how to put those three together with pretty devastating effects. Uh, so, so today when we're thinking about what does that look like, it is, it is our ability to take something like AI as a capability and then integrate it in with our very robust uh, intel collection systems and our fire systems and to develop something which is a, a, a new capability. And so what we saw was uh, in, in traditional rotations, uh, from the time that a target is identified until when rounds uh, finally got on target, uh, in some of the best cases it was taking us about 15 minutes. But now what we could do is you could fly uh, an unmanned system. Uh, it can automatically identify a camouflaged enemy platform using its, its object detection capability. And then we can generate that fire mission and have rounds on target in less than a minute. Uh, and so that significant capability with a human in the loop uh, allowed us to be able to, to really tighten up our, our kill chain in, in pretty significant ways. The one thing I've touched upon, you know, the title is Transforming War Fighting Readiness, and we, we build readiness and forces command. But what Brett's talking about, we're executing that today in a training environment to find out what works, what doesn't work, how best to incorporate it, what structure do we need so we, we can optimize the efficiency and the lethality. 
But I will highlight, as we're doing this today, the last rotation was at the Joint Readiness Training Center. And those of who have been there are very familiar with what that terrain looks like. Now, we're also doing it with the next rotation out at the National Training Center, which is a very different environment that you're going to be operating in, yet we project the same hybrid risks against them. And literally, as we speak, the 25th out in Hawaii, which has a completely different ecosystem in which they're operating in, is, is executing the same tasks with much of the same equipment. What we're identifying, though, again, is a worldwide army with worldwide deployability and requirements. We have to identify, depending on where you're fighting, what is that best mix? What operates best? As we saw at JRTC, it wasn't straight autonomous because there's areas that your UAVs couldn't penetrate. So you had to have, back to the soldier, the long-range surveillance that had to infiltrate, place eyes on from a subsurface hide to provide that feedback to the commander to make the decision. And that's what we're talking about. How do you optimize the warfare? How do you have speed of decision making with the depth of information that's coming in? And where does that come from? But there's still a human that's out there. There's now equipment that's optimizing portions of that. And it's different throughout the world. And that, as we continue to train, will better refine the formations. And they don't need to look alike. If I could uh, just add one more thing to it is that, um, you know, traditionally with all of the UASs that we had uh, flown formerly, uh, you've got someone that's looking at a screen. Uh, and, and you are only as good as that person that is looking at that screen at that particular time. And so when we take things uh, like the integration of, of, of some of the AI, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate all of that data exhaust. Um, now, I don't think that we'll ever get to eliminate it, but, but the point is, is, is to be able to reduce that uh, so that now uh, it's no longer just as good as the eyeballs that are looking at that screen. We now are enhanced with, with these additional capabilities to see things that that human eye would not have seen on, it, on its own. The, the issue of, of the applicability uh, globally, is, I think, is obviously hugely important. And I think as a caveat to my own focus on the, on the Ukraine war, uh, you know, I need to recognize that the Ukraine war is the it, Ukraine is the perfect terrain for the systems that are being created. There, not surprisingly, the systems are being designed to optimize for that. It's a whole other animal when you go to to operate in uh, you know uh, rainforest, uh, for example. You can try to do this in Taiwan; it's going to look like a very different thing. And I just want to say that one thing that we haven't talked a lot about, but that will be more important, I suspect, in places like that, are unmanned ground systems. Because if you can't fly, you can walk. Yeah. And you're still going to want to lead with steel and not blood. And this is another thing that has struck uh, uh, me and Kim on this trip compared to the last trip we did to Ukraine six months ago, has been a dramatic improvement in the use of unmanned ground systems for many purposes, from combat to, to, uh, to logistics to medevac to various other things. That is really taking off in Ukraine, and I think that that will be one of the things that we will find permeating other theaters that are less conducive to aerial uh, platforms. Well, I agree. Brett, we resource you with some of those, too. Yeah. We're quite generous. Can we maybe advance a little more along these lines about maneuverability here? I think they're hitting on something that is particularly interesting. Maneuverability, lethality, survivability. Any of you want to address those factors? Well, I think each, along each three of those lines, mm -hmm. maneuverability, survivability, and lethality uh, are all part of the, the transformation that we have. Part of the survivability is you know, the headquarters that we maintain. If, and you, you were with us in Iraq and Afghanistan, you saw what we had there, and they're not survivable in the current battlefield. They're easily detectable, and if anything, the, at the beginning of the Ukraine war identified, if you have a large non-mobile headquarters that's emitting within the electromagnetic spectrum, you will not survive. And we've taken that. And part of the technology has allowed us to get much smaller, and part of that also has been able to remote some of the capabilities that are emitters. If you recall from previously, the antenna farms that were right next to your headquarters, because they're part of it, can now be remoted out to an extended period that are outside of the effective range of an artillery piece. So the, what you're being targeted is you almost have a zero emission capability so you can hide. It also reduces that. And, and I won't steal part of Brett's thunder, because we've had these discussions, GRTC, of reducing the size of the talk, maintaining not only its survivability, but its efficiencies of previous. Just because you get smaller doesn't mean you're going to be be better if you can't execute those requirements that an operations center has to do to synchronize and fight and plan for di you know, different planning horizons. But when you do that and you have the ability to be much more mobile, 
more invisible on the battlefield, that's the survivability. And lethality is growing every day. You just heard Brett talk about the capability we have for targeting and how it reduces our ability to provide fires on the enemy. And that's throughout the plethora of capabilities that we have out there. And mobility, I'm a big fan of the new infantry squad vehicle. And that's not just maneuverability, but the mobility that they had because Previously, you had the, the limitations that an infantryman, 2.5, I think you identified, to three kilometers an hour. Well, now you're moving 20 kilometers per hour, and you can move across the battlefield, and in the last exercise that we executed in the defense, when we identified where the enemy was moving in their attack, we were able to adjust the formation, put them in a position of advantage in advance of the enemy, and be able to destroy them before they were able to fully operationalize. And, and with that, Brad, I actually want to hand it to you because there's additional portions of that. How they then, because of the ability to watch, how the enemy has to deploy and can't mass their formations because they can be seen and destroyed. How quickly that they could respond. And I think there's capabilities that we learned out of this rotation that we're sharing across the Army and getting better. Yeah, General Pop said he wasn't going to steal my thunder, but he absolutely I just, just did. did. We've um, been together for 25 years, so. <laughs> No guilt. Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, so starting off with the command post piece of this, um, you know, uh, I think that we all remember these, these huge command posts that we, that we took forward to Iraq and Afghanistan. And part of that was, uh, you know, when, when I'm asked about what are the things that are most exciting about, about transformation and contact, uh, one of the things that I go back to is, is the things that we're doing with the network. These command posts could not retain their capability if we had to do things the way that we did before. We have developed all of these systems uh, that power each one of our warfighting functions, and we've developed them in these very stove-piped manners. And so it took this massive humanity all co-located in order to be able to do what we do best, which is synchronize combined arms maneuver. And so we were able to do it, but we did it with humanity, right? People operating their warfighting function, but then talking to other people in order to be able to synchronize effects. And so what, what's been going on and what is exciting about um, uh, us being able to be part of what's called C2Fix uh, is to be able to now figure out how are we taking those, those architectures and start to stitch them together in a much more uh, you know, collaborative manner. And so now these systems are, are becoming, you know, the, the term is federated, right? So we can, we can figure out what are the solutions in order to be able to get you know, system A to talk to system B. Uh, but really we're just doing that so that we can inform what's going on with the, the next generation C2 system so they can build something from the ground up that's, that's truly integrated. And what it allows you then to be is it allows you to be much, much smaller. And so we used to have you know, uh, 30 or so vehicles, these enormous tents and these antenna farms that were uh, what comprised your brigade command post. And then during this last rotation, uh, our second brigade had, had just four Humvees uh, all uh, backed up uh, behind one another. And that was a brigade command post that had every bit of the capability and functionality of those enormous command posts uh, used to have. And so with that is tremendous survivability. And then as, as the network has then uh, gained new capabilities, things like um, uh, you know, star links or star shields, things like that, you are now able to create a command post that has zero electromagnetic signature. Not a single thing emitted from it. Now, granted, if your soldiers are disciplined and they're not like me right now, I've, I think I've got you know, two cell phones, an aura, and a Garmin, and so I have this tremendous signature that I'm emitting right now. Uh, but if we can be disciplined about those things, uh, when uh, any of these electromagnetic sniffers are flying over you, they won't be able to find you because this antenna farm now can be as, as far as you know, two kilometers away with a single fiber optic cable that runs from that antenna farm and powers uh, all of the systems that are inside that command post. So tremendous survivability that's out there. And then for the mobility piece, the infantry squad vehicle, uh, you, can, you can put two of them inside a CH-47. Uh, you can air assault those things at, uh, at, at long distances. The last one we did was 575 miles. And so what you have now is you have a capability that arrives on the battlefield where you have soldiers that aren't moving at 2.5 kilometers per hour, but moving at 25 kilometers per hour. And so you can rapidly aggregate 
large combat formations. And so within the first 36 hours, they were able to, to, to secure you know, five different intermediate objectives. Uh, and then during the, the defense, uh, for the first time, an infantry brigade combat team was able to wage a mobile defense as opposed to the static positional defense, which we normally have to do. A tremendous capability. And so when the opposing force uh, introduced his attacking forces, uh, he couldn't do them in the way that he normally does. He had to be very incremental, very serialized in the introduction of his forces, much more careful uh, because uh, he knew that he had a much more mobile force that could exercise a mobile defense. This issue of, th this is a huge issue that, and, I'm, and I'm thrilled that you are, are taking this up in this way and I'm thrilled that you're working it with the fantastic 101st uh, Air Assault Division um, because it's a great uh, example of the problem that the Russians and the Ukrainians are now having. We are seeing protracted positional warfare on that front and the primary reason for that is that neither side has figured out how to keep vehicles alive in the attack. Uh, the Russians keep trying fairly stupidly with mass armored attacks. They're, 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 they're not as stupid as they look. They keep trying innovations, but they keep failing. Because fundamentally, when you, when you can see every vehicle on the battlefield, and you can kill almost anything that you can see, you're not keeping vehicles alive. And that means that they are advancing at foot pace. You can't make and exploit breakthroughs at foot pace. You just cannot. And so if we're going to see a breakout of positional warfare in this war, and I predict that we will, um, it's going to come because one side or the other or both figures out how to keep vehicles alive on this battlefield. And this is where the new forms of protection become essential. And they also lead to some differential, so at least for me, interesting um, changes in the way that I think about vehicles. I've been a big tank guy my entire professional life. I'm a huge fan of the M1, um, big fan of, of tanks in general. Do we still need tanks? Yes, we do. We need tanks for all the reasons we've always needed tanks, because if the enemy has tanks, you need to have something else that will be able to go up against a tank. And you need mobile protected firepower, and that's what tanks provide. But tanks are not survivable on the current battlefield in their current configuration without an additional protective system. So the protected part of mobile protected firepower is changing in what is required to do that. But if you can protect the tank, you can protect lots of other vehicles against these kinds of systems. And sometimes speed is better than armor. So we're seeing the Ukrainians and the Russians using dune buggies, using motorcycles, using all kinds of things. You say, is that survivable on the battlefield? Well, of course it's not survivable on the battlefield, except it is. Because an individual tank, an individual uh, dune buggy has a better chance of survival on the battlefield than an individual tank, which is going to be a drone magnet. So I think there's a, it's a fantastic the way that you're opening up the aperture here to think about what kinds of vehicles we can put on the battlefield and expect to be able to make them survive because we're going to have to develop the systems that will allow almost any vehicle that can, that can um, support it survive. And we're not myopic in our approach to this. And we've had great discussions about this because there's a concern, would you draw a conclusion that the tank is no longer part of the future fight? And Dr. Keg is 100% right. And we accept that too. The combined arms maneuver fight is what we do best. And we continue to train on that as we've looked, we said now myopically just at the light fight in the 101st, but again at the National Training Center with our heavy formations, they are out there doing exactly that continue to build the competencies of the combined arms fight, bringing it together time and place for penetration, exploitation, you need that, but identifying the gaps that we've identified in the Ukraine fight and then building the capability to meet that so that they are survivable and they are still dominant capability in the future fight. So that actually segues quite neatly with one of the questions you're all following instructions. Well done. There, if there are more questions, please continue to raise your, your um, index card and we'll come collect them up. But one of the audience members had this question, how does the training center environment in the Indo-Pacific differ from JRTC and the National Training Center as well? well? I'll touch upon that. And you heard yesterday Charlie Flynn was talking about that. First, it's complementary. It's absolutely com complementary. Remember the training centers themselves, you know, those are our capstone events. Let's not forget the fact there's still home station training that takes place. There's still squads and individual soldiers every morning from PT4 that are training to build competencies at Echelon. 
But as you build that competency up to the brigade level and now the division, then you take that into the arena of the CTCs. One of the, the strengths that I see out at the, at the JPMRC in the Indo-Pacific, and this is also for JMRC, which is in Germany with the European theater, is the allies incorporated into that fight and building up the capabilities of all the formation as we, as we fight together. Also, the terrain in which they're fighting in is quite different, and we draw different lessons learned. And one of the beauties when you come off of the, the pure JPMRC that's in Hawaii or in Alaska, they have the ability to project that training capability into theater, into other locations within the Indo-Pacific, and then tie in with our allies and partners that are fighting in that location. Just the ability to be able to, to deploy that, that capability, you know, a power projection capability into the theater proves our ability, A, to be able to do that, and then to be able to land, fight as a combined arms team with our allies and partners. So all of them build up the competencies. They're complementary to each other. And again, it, it, it's also symbiotic. We work very well together and exchange observer controllers. We change partners so that we, the lessons learned are captured throughout. So two more questions here, um, one of which goes to training in a simulated environment, and one of which comes back, Dr. Kagan, to what lessons would you derive from the very real world fight in Ukraine that you think might be transferable to the Indo-Pacific? So I'll let you think about that one for a second. General Sylvia, can you address this question of the role simulations are playing in training now as well? Yeah. Um, so this past summer, we had the opportunity, um, a, a tremendous opportunity given to us by our Forces Command uh, to be able to do uh, a warfighter exercise, uh, which, is a, which is a large uh, simulation exercise uh, based in an Indo-Pacific scenario. And then right on the heels of that, uh, be able to, to transition to the live environment uh, where we uh, uh, did power projection from Fort Campbell uh, through a large scale long range air assault uh, down into the box there at the Joint Readiness Training Center. And, and the, the difference between those two was that in the, uh, the, the real fight, uh, you know, the, the live one going down to GRTC, you know, I used all of my organic assets from across the division. Uh, so, you know, about 80 aircraft, uh, you know, that, that moved, uh, you know, roughly when it was all said and done, we had about 6,000 soldiers that were involved in, in that between uh, all of the, the mission planning and, and then getting everyone down there and then getting into the fight down there. Um, and I fought with the, the combat aviation brigade that I have. Um, but, but the Army is designing the, the Air Assault Combat Aviation Brigade. And in simulation, I was able to fight the Air Assault Combat Aviation Brigade, which gave me four times the amount of lift uh, aircraft. So my heavy lift aircraft, the, the CH-47s, which we'll be fielding over the course of the next few years. Uh, and then I replaced all of my, my Blackhawks, my UH-60s, with the future long-range assault aircraft. Uh, in order for us to be able to build the doctrine, as we talked about, because it's more than just new pieces of equipment and new capabilities. It's about the doctrine. It's about how do we, how do we build the sustainment? How do we train our staffs in order to be able to employ this in a different environment? And so the value of simulation is, is absolutely essential for us to be able to, to test drive as many of these concepts, many of them new burgeoning concepts that are not fully fielded, so that when we do receive these capabilities, all we have to do is receive the kit. Uh, we've already built the foundation for them to be able to begin operating. Dr. Kagan, you want to extrapolate some lessons that might be transferable? Yeah, look, so to make a really obvious point, the Indo-Pacific is big and it's not one fight. And so I want to start by saying, we're, we're, we're mostly, most of the time we're thinking about you know, having to deal with a China contingency and defend Taiwan, but there's another fight tonight problem out there, which is defending South Korea. And I want to highlight that because over the past few days, we've seen the Ukrainians reporting that there are as many as 3,000 North Korean soldiers uh, fighting, training, and, and fighting with the Russians. It's very important that we not treat the North Korea threat as a solved problem. It's been a solved problem in many respects, sort of, for decades. But that problem is changing, and it will continue to change as the Russians pay their debt to the North Koreans through training, access, uh, technology, insight, and various other things that are going to change the nature of that problem. So, and there, I think you're going to find a lot of lessons coming from Ukraine pretty rapidly and straightforwardly transferable um, to a theater that's not crazily dissimilar. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about uh, lessons for the, what is fundamentally an air maritime uh, fight. The first thing that we need to, to uh, think about is 
there's drone, there are drones and then again there are drones, right? So we've got in Ukraine millions of drones. Many of those are the small handheld Mavics, uh, you know, $3,000 a pop with ranges out to 9, 10, uh, 11 kilometers. Um, those will be useful and important if it comes to a fight on the island of Taiwan or on a particular island. You will see, I think, modified for the terrain, a lot of very similar phenomena to what we're seeing. But what about for the distances between islands? Well, here you need to start looking at the larger drones that the Ukrainians and the Russians are both fielding that have ranges, um, th th not radius, but full range, um, and then they lose them out to 40 or 50 kilometers. So uh, the Institute for the Study of War will have a paper coming out pretty soon actually trying to draw some very explicit lessons for the uh, Taiwan uh, defense scenario from this. And one of the things we've done as part of that is map out, if you look at the entire Japanese archipelago and the entire Taiwanese archipelago, and you map out to 40, 50, or 70 clicks, and look at what kind of coverage you get, it's very remarkable. Now then you could say, okay, well that's fine, but you know, with a, with a kind of uh, you know, 20 to 20, you know, 20 some odd kilogram payload that you could put on one of those things, you're not sinking a ship. Very true, you're not sinking a ship. But do I need to sink it, or do I need to achieve a mission kill? And if I need to achieve a mission kill, well, can I do that with a drone like that? Very probably. How do I know that? Because I know the Ukrainians have done things like that to the Russian Navy. And I know that, especially when you start thinking about sort of englobing a capital ship with a gazillion drones, and then using that and the distraction that that causes and the partial blinding that you could accomplish, then putting a high-end, high-speed anti-shipping missile on that vessel, well, then you can sink it. And I think the last bit of this is the electronic warfare part of this is going to be relevant wherever there are humans using the electromagnetic spectrum. And in many respects, even more relevant in a theater where, look, what's the big problem with EW? You need to have a big generator if you're going to power a big EW thing, right? The great thing about a ship is it's got lots of electricity. So I think that we will see a different kind of EW configuration. I'm sure we will see a different kind of EW configuration in the theater and a different kind of race. But I think a lot of the lessons, if we extrapolate them back to the few more general principles, are going to be extremely apposite, both for us and for our potential adversaries. So we have another question here that problematizes some of what you were just referencing that I'd be curious to hear you address or, or any of the panelists. The question is, how do we maintain advantage on the battlefield with AI or drones when our adversaries have less issue with keeping a human on or in the loop for kinetic effects? I think that one of the things that, that, that we talked about a little bit is that um, as we are looking at new forms of mass that are showing up here on, on the battlefield, one of the, the comments that was made was about new forms of protection uh, that are out there. And, and, and I do understand that, um, you know, their ability to, to onboard AI and, and, and to use it in, a, in, in certainly a, a less discriminatory fashion uh, is, is certainly an issue um, that, that, you know, we won't be able to resolve. Um, but the idea of our ability to generate new forms of protection is the, is the critical piece of this. That there is no silver bullet. You can't just, you know, pull out the laser and it, and it will resolve all of the issues as it pertains to this. Uh, and so, so we've got to take this very layered and integrated approach as we look at these things. Uh, there, there will always be these high-end, um, uh, very uh, capable systems that we'll have to continue to invest in, um, but we also need to think about everything else that would be less than that uh, and in order for us to be able to have this layered approach. And it starts with, first off, just soldier fundamentals. And we've got to continue to work on how are we going to operate in a very distributed, a very dispersed manner. How are we going to retain the survivability that we know that we can do? And then how do we layer certain capabilities on top of that, whether they're just you know, small emitters, drone busters, drone defenders, things like that, all the way up to, to high-end systems, you know, Thad, Patriot, or others, in order for us to ensure that we have this, this you know, parity in terms of how we find new forms of protection to counter the, the new forms of mass that are out there. I think. <clears throat> We've been having a discussion in the, in the, with, among the America and its allies about lethal autonomous systems that have been, it has been very much of an ethical discussion. And the issue, the main issue that people have been very concerned about, rightly, is how do we prevent these things from killing civilians? How do we prevent, prevent these things from hitting targets they shouldn't hit? 
I want to flip it around because I want to suggest that actually the reason why we're seeing delays in the fielding of lethal autonomous systems in Ukraine are because the uh, opponents in that war are solving a harder problem. And that in many respects, the problem that it has been keeping people up at night rightly is a lesser included problem. Because the problem that they need to solve is how do I make sure that my lethal autonomous system only kills bad guy T-72s, not my T-72s? That, that is in principle a harder problem than how do I make sure that it only kills T-72s and it doesn't kill, kill children? I think this, uh, I'm sorry, Fred, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, no, so, it, so I think the, 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 the challenge of figuring out how to employ LAS in a close fight scenario yeah is going to drive to technical limitations on those systems that will be usable if they don't automatically address the problem of having them not go after civilians. And wh how do I, what else is interesting about this? The Russians haven't fielded them either. And it's not because the Russians are afraid of killing civilians, because the Russians are actually right now using drones as target practice on civilians in Kherson. All right, we're, I mean, we're seeing them do with, with manned uh, with human controlled systems, everything that people would be afraid would happen with lethal autonomous systems. That's not why they're not using them. They're not using them because they can't solve that harder problem. When that harder problem has been solved or mitigated to an acceptable level, I think you'll find that there will be a basis for a much higher degree of comfort for using these systems on an ethical basis. And that ethical basis, I think it's, it's a larger discussion because you automatically default that we see the, this autonomous killing system that's out there that has no constraints upon it, from the civilian to the, the military to the vehicle. But we've operated in a somewhat similar environment previously, and there's mechanisms we can put in place uh, in your framework of the battlefield. I mean, you have weapons tight, weapons free, depending where you're at. So I've, I have a feeling as we develop the capability, and I believe it's, it's here, as we implement it into the battlefield, there are mechanisms and means we can put in for constraints where you can have a weapons free, where it can be autonomous out. When it's, you know, it's, when it's missile to missile incoming capabilities and you don't want to take the time, you can easily identify that that is a threat missile. I don't need to take it through a decision change. We can take it right out. But as you get into that closer flight, that probably makes more sense that you have a, a, a human in the lethal decision chain, you know, when it's not machine on machine, but when it's on machine on human or possibility of on human. So I think it takes a, it's a much broader, we faced these things before, there's mechanisms we can put in place, and those type of constraints, I think, will, will negate the emotional nature of this argument. So speaking of the emotional nature, we have another related question on that front as well. Namely, do you think the US public is going to understand casualties from unprotected vehicles, like up-armored Humvees all over again? And related to that, are we ready for the level of casualties that we might see in a great power conflict, great power war? I think we're going to be challenged. Thank you for staring at me, Brett. And by the way, when Brett said he was, <laughs> yeah, he was grateful for that, that training opportunity this summer of back-to-back -back simulation into the real, I think he's being gracious. He was not that happy when I brought it up with him the first time. <laughs> uh, but his execution was excellent. But as you talk about, when you take a look at the battlefield itself, you know, there was over 180,000 killed in the first year of the Ukraine-Russian war. Think about those depth of casualties. And that's not something that we have faced for a long time. And as of recently, as, as reported by the Institute of Study of War, you know, a, a thousand a day on some of the attacks. That's a battalion at a time, a battalion of soldiers that no longer exist. And we haven't had to reconstitute formations, nor have we faced casualties at that level. Do I think we as a nation are prepared for that type? It, first caveat with negated, people say, well, we're going to fight different, it's not going to be the same. Casualty rates are going to be very high in large-scale combat operation. They are. And if you lose a capital ship, you know, that could be upwards of 4,000 people in one strike. No. I don't think that we're mentally prepared for that. And one of the things that we look at, because readiness isn't just the maneuver in the formation, but it also comes back to the individual soldier and the leader. Do we have the resilience? at this lowest echelon in order to face these type of losses. Are we training to do that? Where you don't lose two, but only two may survive of a formation. And we have to look at how do we do that? How do we build that strength 
not just in the soldier, but to the leader. It's emotionally attached to the formation. And in the last 20 years, we really did control the tempo. We could dictate, we're going to reconstitute, we're going to take a step back, we're going to assess a formation. In large-scale combat operations, and I use Ukraine, you don't have the latitude to do that. You don't own and control the tempo. The fight yesterday that was devastating continues on tomorrow. And you must continue to fight. I think, and we have recognized this, this isn't something that has come up into question. And we're driving our formations to build that level of resiliency, build that level of combat readiness, build that level of trust in each other to continue on the fight. The, the second part of that question, which was not the difficult part of the question, um, uh, was, was the idea of the, the platform that they're in. And, and I think that if you, if you, you know, are watching what's taking place over in Ukraine, um, you know, a very heavy, you know, well-fortified tank is still not affording you yeah. the protection uh, that, that, that speed and mobility would be able to provide you uh, in something that, that has less you know, protection uh, on board with it. Sir, while you have the mic, I have another quite specific question for you. Namely, can you provide additional insight on the various career fields and disciplines involved in the multifunction reconnaissance company? Before, oh, sorry, still, sir. No, nope, go ahead. But we can't have these absolutes either in combat. You can't be off, you can only be in an up-armored Humvee. You can only do this. You can't take your body armor off. We have got, we talked about delegating down. First, soldiers, commanders, leaders at Echelon are trained very well. They understand the character of war, the nature of war, the execution of TTPs. We have to trust leaders at Echelon to make the right decision in the environment they're in. And a personal example, in Iraq, when they said we couldn't use you know, the gators off the post. Well, in the environment that we were in, that Johnny Carson back there was traveling around in, you couldn't take anything up armored or heavy. The terrain wouldn't support it. And it doesn't fit in, you air assault it everywhere. You needed the gators inside. And we needed that mobility platform to provide additional classes of supply and support and be a medevac. So we made deliberate decisions to use gators that are not up armored, off the fob and on operations, because it enhanced our capability. We also on decisions, we were cleaning palm groves when it got to over 130 degrees in the middle of the summer, that we had an approach. You know, we had people that did have moved slowly with, with their bot, full body armor on doing the initial clearing. But then the deliberate carrying behind it, those elements were able to strip off part of the body armor, so they weren't carrying that, and they were much more mobile, flexible, and able to execute the task given to them. Now, what did we do? It wasn't a blanket decision, but you set the conditions, you mitigate the risk. There's still risk. But you mitigate it as a leader because you understand the environment. The environment we fought in was different than those that were in Saladin province, that were different from the western, you know, the western border area. And we had the latitude and support of our commanders to be able to make those decisions at the lowest level. All right, so you stole the mic back. I so I'm going to sure did. ask you another question, and then we'll go to General <laughs> Sylvia. Oh. So your question, sir is what do you think about working with allies and partners to decrease the cost of transformation and contact? Is it possible that it should only be national? Allies may have different experiences which may be useful. So General Silvia, reconnaissance teams, and then we'll come back to allies and partners. So for those that might not be able to hear because we don't have a mic on the floor, MI specifically, MOSs. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. Um, uh, that, that's good. Um, because I'll, I'll, I'll answer it um, just a little bit differently. So your specific question was about the multifunctional reconnaissance company. The multifunctional reconnaissance company um, is, is um, really just kind of a new scouting element, a new reconnaissance element. Um, and, and, it, and it operates off of many of the same fundamentals, but it just uses different things now. So, uh, so whereas before, our old scout elements were, you know, were, were infantry soldiers that were forward um, you know, with uh, some type of optic you know, device in order to be able to identify what was happening out in front. Uh, but now, our, our ability to see and sense is different. Uh, 
Uh, and so while we do still need those, because like uh, General Pop has talked about, there will be those times based off of terrain or weather or other things that you do still need to put that human out there. So we do have to have those, those fundamental scout formations. But now we add in them these other capabilities to see and sense, whether they are uh, UAV operators or whether they are uh, EW uh, operators, uh, they have these systems that are then forward in order for us to be able to see and sense. But to your specific question about MI, about our military intelligence soldiers that are out there. So one of the things that we are doing in the prototyping of the Mobile Brigade Combat Team is we've actually taken uh, that, that military intelligence company out of that brigade. And we've now taken them and, and we've taken that analytic power and we've put it up at the, at the division level. Um, now granted, now um, you know, fundamentally as a, as a former brigade commander, if anybody told me that my higher headquarters was gonna do my work for me, I would have told them that they were a liar. All right? I have matured. Somewhat. Um, so, uh, um, you know, so the idea uh, doesn't sound uh, fundamentally sound. Um, but what we are doing is that uh, we, we are pushing simplicity down to the tactical edge in order to be able to keep our tactical formations light and mobile. And so what we need to do is in order to provide access to, to the, the, the types of information that would be available to them, I have to pull them out of that formation. But now they are completely dedicated to that formation. And while they are, their physical location is at a higher echelon, their focus is exactly the same. And so, so there is still a requirement. But the idea is, you know, do they need to be, and this is when, when we're talking about the prototyping aspect of this, is do they need to be structured the same way? If I have uh, an AI tool that scrapes all of the, the chat, uh, all of the texts uh, that are coming in with all of the information that's coming in from all the sensors that are out there, and that AI tool does a lot of the work that humans were doing before, do I need as many analysts as I, as I did previously, or do I, do I have technology that can then replace them? And so then I, I keep the, the humans at the places where I need the humans, and I can use the technology where I can use the technology. Their partners and allies transforming in contact, primarily national. Want to take that one, or, or Dr. Kagan as well? First, I, th I don't think it is just going to be national. As you can see, the formations that we've identified, I think we do owe it to initially start the initial tranche of this is to identify what is and is not working. And then we're going to have to proliferate that with our, with our allies and partners. I want to, the strength that we have is our allies and partners, and we fight together. I and mean, we have a common ammunition, we've got common systems, we've got common tactics, techniques, and procedures, and we train together. So it only makes sense as we talk transformation. Again, there's three different time horizons of modernization. You know, this is that short duration and year of execution. So this is a, a small component of that, but it is one that we will share, not just should share, but we will share to make sure that those allies and partners see what we're incorporating, why we're incorporating that, and have them incorporate it themselves. And where they've got capabilities that we can incorporate, if they've got a better UAV capability, a better, you know, with a human machine integration, to have better capacity or capability that we can incorporate, we'll certainly use that. I mean, downstairs, when you walk the floor, you'll see no shortage of other nations' capabilities, and it's pretty good. And a number of those have been incorporated into our formations across our allies and partners. Absolutely. Look, Do, Dr. Kagan, I, have, yeah. I would love you to come in on this one as well, but while you have this mic, this is the disadvantage of lapel mics. We have another interesting question that just came out of these cards as well that you might be able to address. How are power and energy readiness requirements evolving? And what future capabilities are needed on that front? I know we touched on a little bit of the, the power that's needed for some of this, but I think that's an interesting question in isolation as well. On the, on the allies and partners thing, mm -hmm. uh, to begin with, the United States will transform better than our allies and partners at scale. Some of them will transform better than we will on the much smaller scales on which they operate. 
without getting into issues of policy here, I simply observe the fact that there, we have allies who have people on the front lines in Ukraine learning lessons very directly and bringing those back. And we have allied militaries that are looking very hard at very radical transformation in a very short period of time, not at scale. We have allies and partners in the Asia Pacific region that are looking at this very intently and are probably frankly ahead of us in terms of thinking about how to incorporate some of the lessons into that theater. This is a transformation and, and we're facing an enemy alliance, an enemy coalition. We haven't settled on exactly what to call it yet. But we're facing an enemy coalition that is integrating its own lessons learning in a very, very tight fashion, which should frankly scare the bejesus out of us. This is, this is a team effort, and it's gonna to have to be a team effort, and we should not take for granted, the United States, we should not take for granted that we will be in the lead across the board on this, although we will be the ones who transform at scale best of any of our allies or partners. In terms of energy requirements, look, yes, they're real and they're serious. Um, so far, I have not encountered anything in Ukraine that tells me that they're particularly different from the kinds of requirements that we've seen uh, already in our highly energized uh, kind of warfare. Where I think you will start to see that change is when we go, when we really start moving to directed energy weapons um, to, to deal with the, with the drones, uh, particularly in a battle space where you know the electrical grid is not reliable, where the adversary is working on destroying that, and so you're going to have to be able to generate power, but you can't have a big footprint, and 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 and. But at the end of the day, I'm going to simplify this in a. I'm going to simplify it excessively, but there's some truth in this. Either you can keep stuff on the battlefield alive or you can't. If you can, then you can think about keeping a generator alive. You can think about keeping a fuel, fuel storage alive. You can think about keeping tankers of fuel moving to it. And then you can think about having the energy that you're going to need to do this. If you can't keep stuff on the battlefield alive, then you're not going to keep any of that stuff alive, but then you can't keep anything alive. That's an oversimplification, but I do think that it's very easy for us to have a sort of a conversation with each side of our brain and not have them link. And one is to say, I can, I can see everything, I can kill everything, so I can't have a power plant, therefore I can't have energy. Well, okay, but if you can't keep anything alive, then it doesn't matter whether you have a power plant or not. But if the power plant powers something that can keep the power plant alive? What, one of the... One of the things that makes us smaller and more survivable is as we take our, our command and control systems and we get them to smaller form factors, then our energy consumption goes way down. And, and that was one of the things that allowed us to, to be so much smaller is, is, you know, we used to have these huge uh, server stacks that, that used to sit inside of each one of our command posts and we don't need that anymore. Uh, and so as we get uh, smaller and smaller, we reduce significantly our power consumption uh, and, and that's been critical for us, is figuring out how do we get rid of those generators that are easy to spot, easy to locate. And, and so finding ways to, to get smarter at that has been essential for us. As well. I'm sorry, that actually triggered in my mind a specific example that, that points to the continuation of that, uh, of that excellent point, which is, look, the drive to have longer range drones is a drive to have reduced power consumption because the just for all the obvious reasons right so we had a very fascinating conversation um, with the ukrainian who was talking about a particular platform that they were trying to develop to be able to use for a particular purpose and i'm not going to say anything more than that in this forum um, but the problem the dilemma that they had was that the platform was not aerodynamically stable enough that it could be operated with a simple AI. And so it required a big chip with all of the requirements that came from that. And that, that was, but this one potential solution that was discussed was if the platform were made more aerodynamically stable, then the AI that controls it can be much simpler, can be put on a much smaller chip 
with much less power consumption and everything that goes along with that. So this gets us to an important thing which we haven't mentioned here, but which I think is worth bringing out, which is that the transformation, the technological transformation is happening on different scales, on different time scales, and based, based, on, different, based on different things. So the big platforms like tanks and planes and things have hardly, not really changed at all in this war. Um, smaller systems like the, like the Mavics and the other kinds of drones change a lot, but they don't change instantly. It takes time to produce lots of a new kind of drone. Individual electronics components, things that will give you access to different bands in the electromagnetic spectrum, either for jamming or for communication, those can change very rapidly and proliferate through the theater in weeks. And then, of course, any change that you can make with software proliferates not instantly. That this, is, this is important. It does not proliferate instantly. Because you don't have all your drones hooked up to the network all the time for very obvious reasons. So people have to go around and do this. But it can proliferate in days. These kinds of, so, but as we think of these changes, we have to think about integrating all of these changes together. There are things that you can do with software to change your hardware requirements to offset problems like energy, energy consumption and energy requirements. So I would be remiss if I didn't travel all the way from Fort Liberty, North Carolina and acknowledge the fact that sitting in my lap is this question of how are we going to incorporate special operations forces in LISCO. That said, I'm conscious of time as well. So if any of our panelists would like to take on that question, I'm open to it. Yes? We already or? have. Okay. And we're getting back some of those base core capabilities of our special operations forces. Uh, the rotations that I talked about out at the uh, National Training Center, first, they're joint. We're utilizing the Air Force with the red flag exercise. The last one we did had 50 different aircraft, and we nested a long range uh, out of sector attack, aviation attack with them. Not a lot of Navy on the desert, but we are able to simulate that to get the, the fires for their capability. But internal armed services, in order to set up some of these long-range air assaults, we had to set up FARPs. So we used our special operations forces to do long-range reconnaissance, identify the locations, and then scout those up, scout them, and then be the pathfinders to allow them to come in and provide security for them. So we've done that out at the National Training Center. We've done that down at the Joint Readiness Training Center. I know they're doing that out in the Pacific. So incorporating the special operations forces in that regard. In future rotations, uh, we're setting up a rotation where we, we, again, the division, we're putting soft in early to do that early development of the operating environment, which is what they do. They're gonna, we're gonna have a, a guerrilla force in which they're gonna link up with, which is gonna be a uh, force that they're gonna utilize as their thickening force in order to execute those tasks. And they're gonna set the conditions for then the division to come in. And the division's gonna come in and do what a division does, and that's it underneath their higher headquarters, which is, setting the conditions, out of cycle, long range air assaults that SOF has already identified the targets, they've identified the FARP locations, provided feedback and incorporated the guerrilla force. So the division's gonna come in and they're gonna execute those divisional tasks that set the condition for the brigade rotation that has the force on force from the reception stage and onward integration. But to set those conditions, it starts with the SOF, bringing in then the conventional, and then the follow-on for the direct combat location. So they are fully integrated with everything that we're doing, and they're part of every discussion that we're having at this time. And we're setting up soft, specific rotations so we can build back those baseline competencies that we've seen previously. Thank you, sir. So we are sadly about out of time, and I do want to offer the opportunity for each of you to offer a couple of closing remarks, key takeaways from this conversation. Thank you to everyone for submitting these questions. I will make sure that I have them collected and pass them on so that certainly our panelists can see the speakers, see the question, sorry, that we're, we were not able to cover as well. General Sylvia, would you like to begin with, begin with closing yeah. remarks? Um, I, I, I just, um, you know, the 101st Airborne Division Air Assault is, uh, is, is really proud uh, to be able to be part of the transformation in, in, in contact. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, you know, our responsibility is to, is to build combat readiness. 
Uh, and what we have found along the way is as, as we are doing this transformation in contact, um, we're, we're not just uh, innovating and, and, and integrating new pieces of equipment, uh, we're building readiness uh, with, with all of these new transformational concepts, the structures, the people, uh, and, and the equipment. Uh, and, and, and like I, uh, I, I tell people all the time is that, you know, we're not an innovation division, we're a division that innovates. And as we look at what the battlefield looks like, uh, we've got to embrace this uh, because whether it's now in training or whether it's in the future in large scale combat operations, uh, we've got to make sure that this culture of innovation stays alive uh, and that we are capable of not just every day uh, being the best war fighters that we can be, um, but we're also innovating in order to be able to meet the emerging threats as they come to us. Uh, so I, I want to thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's been a real honor to sit up here on the stage with these two luminaries, three luminaries up here, uh, and thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Dr. Kagan. I just want to pick up on the thread of what I gather the Secretary of the Army um, said uh, yesterday, that we need to address ourselves to this problem with urgency and as the underdog. Uh, I'll go further and say we need to stop talking about retaining our dominance. Uh, we've been in the habit of, of being dominant for decades, and we've, oh, we generally have had conversations about modernization or transformation that are focused on retaining our dominance. Um, it's not clear to me that we will have dominance necessarily over any particular adversary given in various different time frames. We, we, we are in a world where things are changing very rapidly and major powers are, are at war. So we are in a world that is now bifurcated. There is a world at war and a world that is not at war. We are living in the world that is not at war. But what happens with, in the world at war is that war changes very fast. I'm a military historian. It's one of the, the limited number of things that I'm professionally qualified to opine about <laughs> is that in war, transformation occurs extremely rapidly. And states that are at war change more rapidly than states that are not. This weirdly has been an advantage for the, that the United States has had the upside of the downside of the fact that we have fought a major war in every generation going back to the beginning of the 20th century. And many of our adversaries or putative or, or potential adversaries have not fought for a very long time. That gave us an advantage for all of the tragedy that it also brought to us. Now the shoe is on the other foot. And innovation is being driven in a war that we are largely observing. That should sober us, but above all, it should give us a sense of urgency to think hard, not about retaining dominance, but about the, what may be more realistic, if less optimistic, task of winning. Sir. Hey, first, Professor Davidson, I want to thank her for coming back. And you can see the master way, masterful way in which she facilitates this discussion. There's a reason, and I appreciate what you've done, both in our preparation and coming up here, to let all the key points uh, be drawn out in this discussion. Uh, and, and I'll touch upon my, my panel members. But first, if you're here or listening, one thing I hope that you take away from this discussion is first a sense of comfort and a sense of pride. Because though it's, it's a very difficult time in the world today, you can see from the discussion that we had and what we've laid out for you, we are putting in first the intellectual energy to understand the operating environment and how it's changing, the changing character of war that we see across the globe. We are putting that energy in and we're collecting that. And then we're putting the operational energy in in order to address it. And not just the immediacy of it, but as we look to the future fight and what will, not just emerging, but what's on the future and the horizon, how we will address that. And I always go back to as a one of the directed readings was America's First Battles, yep. which outlines how we always prepared for the last fight, and we were not successful in that first fight. And our commitment to you, and I think you should draw away from the conversation we had, which is propagated throughout the entire force, is that we will not be the next chapter in that book. <laughs> we will be successful. And the second point I'd, I'd ask you to look at, it's not by chance the people that are on the panel up here. And I did have the latitude to pick. You know, it wasn't a lottery that your name came up and started with K. <laughs> what it is, and I'd ask you as, as you look out there, if, 
And it started for me in battalion command. Nobody's an oracle, nobody has all the answers. You need people that you trust intellectually to have discussions with, to build your own base of knowledge, but then also refine your base of knowledge and sharpen what you understand. And you have to do that by people who you trust intellectually. And they're here. I've known Brett Sylvia for three decades. And I trust him intellectually and I bounce things off him all the time. It makes me better. And I've met the Kagans almost two decades ago coming out of Iraq. And from that time, I will tell you, there's a lot of great ideas that I have. And I bounce them off them. And as I start looking at the future of warfare, you know, historians, understanding, it refines my understanding of how we should fight, of where we need to fight and where we need to go. I would ask that you find those people in your life that do that for you. And if you're a professional military officer, you need to do that, both in uniform and out of uniform, because you owe it to the formation to have that best intellectual depth of capacity and understanding. And I want to thank the Kagans for being up here and for Brother Brett to be up here and share that with me. And again, for Professor Davidson, you're now coming into that fold. We've got three years behind us now, and I appreciate it. So thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. To our panel members, th on behalf of AUSA, thank you so much for your insightful remarks today. To the audience, while you're here, please take the time to visit our education zone and tell your story of why you've served. Use the, the podcast or the graphic art to, to do that. Additionally, please take time to, to check out the additional contemporary military forums over the next day, and thank you so much for attending. <laughs>